Welcome to Membership Voice. I'm Caro O'Shea, for those who don't know me, the coordinator of the voice and the host for this evening's webinar. A very special welcome to tonight's presenter, District 9705 Member Attraction Chair, Judy Ford. Hey, Judy, how are you? I'm great, thanks, Caro. Sorry you're looking at two little animals. I don't look like that, but uh, you'll see me later. Super. That's great. But it's important at this stage to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm hosting tonight's webinar. I acknowledge the strength of their continuing culture and offer my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now, what we've all been waiting for, growing your club, a proven recruitment model to be presented by Judy Ford. Over to you, please, Judy, for your presentation. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Caro, very much for inviting me tonight. And uh, I hope that you all get a lot out of this uh, presentation. I assume that you're here because you're interested in getting new members for your clubs, or you may be just interested in membership. But if you are looking for more members for your clubs, I want you to first of all think about your club before you go bringing new people in. Is it the right thing at the time, or do you need to make a few changes to your club before you, you invite people in? For example, if I was 75, would I want to join your club? Or is it full of ex rotor actors that are all young and bouncy? Or for example, if I was 40, would I want to join your club? Which is probably an age where most clubs would be very happy to have a 40 year old. However, if I was 25, would I want to join your club? Because if your club's made up of a lot of elderly people, then they may not just fit. So be sure, get your club in order before you start bringing in new members. That's really important. So I'm sure you all know why people join Rotary, but uh, just to remind you, there are two main reasons. One is that people are looking for fun and fellowship. They want to have friends, they want to have, have something they look forward to, but they also want to make sure that they can do some sort of service. They want to be involved in the community because that's what Rotary is all about, of course. So a few months ago, I went up to Queensland to a seminar that was being put on by the Gold Coast Club, and uh, <clears throat> they had Jason Brown speaking, who is an American, very much into membership, does a lot of speaking, and he was over to talk about his ideas on membership. And one of the things I picked up from him was that he said that, you know, before you start looking for members or if you want to have good, lots of members, you need to have a, have a club that suits the people. And there are three factors that you need to consider. First, of, and, and if you do that, then that means you're relevant. Your club is, has, is relevant to the people around you and they will want to join. So the first thing that he said is, what kind of club is my club? You need to understand that there are a lot of different types of clubs in Rotary now, much different from what it used to be, but maybe you're still traditional, have the meeting once a week and the speaker and all that sort of thing. So maybe that's your club. Or maybe you're a satellite club that you're building a new club or you're just a, an extra part of an old club. Maybe you're a digital club, you're an e-club that you meet online. You might be a passport club where you can go and visit other clubs. You might be a corporate club that comes out of one of the local industries or a hospital or something like that. Maybe you're alumni based, that most of your members are people that have either been exchange students in the past or GSE people, all of those things. Or you might be a Rotaract club. So there's all different types of clubs. Think about what type of club you are and is it the best type of club that you can be. And then you need to decide, does your club have a cause? Because that is really the base backbone of a, of a good club is having something that you see as your cause that you're passionate about. For example, you might have causes, big, big picture causes like helping to eradicate rheumatic heart fever or heart disease in the Northern Territory. Or you might be wanting to help provide water to African nations that are in drought. Or you might take on something like saving the koalas, which of course is something that is actually a club. Or you might be interested in stopping domestic violence, something more on the political line. But if you've got a cause that your whole club is passionate about, that is a really good, strong thing. However, you might also want to just stay in the local scene, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. For example, we've got a club in Canberra that has helped the Canberra PCYC provide a, uh, a food truck. Or you might be helping a local area build up a, a community garden. 
you might want to uh, pack food hampers at Christmas or you might just be keen on collecting food for the local um, emergency centre or you might be a hands-on club where you like to help people and, you know, help men sheds and that sort of thing. So there's lots of different causes. The, co the um, club that I'm a member of, we have a market which we're, we've made our sort of main thing and through that we're able to um, help the local other locals and with their things as well. So these are the sort of things that you can have as a cause. And then the last thing you need to look at is, does my club represent the local demographics? So if you live in a university town, then there's going to be a lot of young people and they make great Rotarians, or you can help them start up a Rotaract club. Or you might live in an area where there are a lot of retirees. If you're down on a south, you know, one of the coastal towns where there's people retire, then look for retirees and don't be frightened to ask older people. Don't think, oh, we must only ask new young people into Rotary. That's rubbish. There's a lot of people that retire at quite an early age, uh, you know, in their 50s that have still got a lot going for them. Get them in as well because they, especially if they've just moved down to your, your uh, local town, they'll be looking to find new friends and what a great way to meet through Rotary. I mean, we, I've been in Rotary for since 1994 and we've moved around a lot because my husband was in the army and everywhere we went we made new friends and I must say that most of my friends are Rotarians so you know Rotary is a great way to make friends as well as to, to um, do good service. You may live in a country town and so most of your people that you would be inviting would be farmer types or just town folk that, that live in the town and work in the town. Or you might be lucky enough to live in a very multicultural area where there's lots of people from all sorts of countries. And please try and get those people to join Rotary because they just add an extra dimension to, to Rotary. So summing it all up, what Jason Brown said was that if you take your club type plus your cause plus your demographic, and if those are really strong, then that's going to help you increase your membership and retention easier. If you think about it, that really makes a lot of sense, that those three things coming together makes your club really relevant to people and they will be very happy to join. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to talk about uh, my proven method, and, I, and it is proven, so I'm not making that up. It's a proven method to find new members. And I do this through, oh, well, before I tell you what how I do it, First of all, let's talk about the best way to find new members. It's to ask people, to talk to people, to your friends, and to tell them about Rotary and get them to know what you do, and then sort of say, well, you know, why don't you come along to a meeting and see what it's all about? That's a really good way, and it's the way that everyone says you must do it. But the problem with that is that if you've got a good friend and you've got ready to say, you know, how about joining us for Rotary, and they say, nah, not interested, makes you feel pretty awful. I mean, you, you shouldn't, absolutely shouldn't, but you do. And that's that's just the way we are because we don't like rejection. So what we need to do is find some way. Oh, oh, sorry, I should remember my slides in a better order. One of the other things I need to remind you is that if you do decide to go and ask people to join Rotary, don't say to them, would you like to join Rotary? Say to them, would you like to volunteer for Rotary? Because if you volunteer, say volunteer, it's not a binding thing. It's just saying, come along and have a bit of fun and see what we do. It's not saying, come along and we will make you a Rotarian and, you know, whether you like it or not. So it's it's a much softer way of encouraging people to get to know Rotary. So anyway, getting back to what I was saying, the reason we don't like doing any of that is because of rejection. So what I suggest you have is a Rotary information evening. Sounds pretty simple, and I'm sure you're all nodding your head saying, yeah, done that, didn't work. And that's probably because you didn't do it quite the same way that I'm suggesting tonight. First of all, you must set a date. And that sounds sort of, oh, yeah, why, why, why is that number one step? Why is that so important? We can work out a date later. No, you must have a date straight away because it's a bit like you meet meet Fred down the road and you say, oh, hi, Fred, haven't seen you for ages. Yeah, hi, Judy, how are you going? And I say, yeah, we must get round and having dinner together. Oh, yes, says Fred, and off we go. So it doesn't happen. But if I say, oh, hi, Fred, great to see you. Hi, Judy, good to see you too. Hey, Fred, are you doing anything on Saturday? Because we'd love you to come around for dinner. 
you've made a date, you've got something in plan, and then you will follow through with it. So setting a date is very important. Then the next thing you've got to do is make a list. Now, this is a list of people that you want to invite to your information night. And they don't have to be your best friends. They don't have to be people you know really well. They can be just people you know that are the sort of people you'd like to have as a, as a member of your Rotary Club. It could be your butcher, your local butcher. It could be your painter. It could be, could be the, um, I don't know, uh, your local lawyer. It could be your, your kid's school teacher. You know, think about all the different types of people that you can invite. And then you do need to make a list and you need that list to have not just their name, but also a postal address and ideally their home address. So if you live in a small country town, that might be a lot easier to work out than if you're in a city. But that's really important and I'll tell you why in a minute. So you make a list and you can either do that different ways. You can just sit at home and make up and then all turn up the next meeting and say, here's my five names, because you should try and get everyone to come up with five names. That's a good idea. So get them to make a list and or if you don't want to do it that way, another way would be to do a brainstorming night in your club. And that's really good for small country towns because everybody knows everyone and it helps you to think up all different people. So anyway, you come up with a list. I think ideally 20 people as a minimum. And then the next thing you've got to do is send them a letter from the president. Not him, though. I don't suggest that's a good idea. So you're going to send a letter. Now, this next slide's a little bit full of words, but it's important that I go through it with you. So the on the left-hand side is a letter, which I will read through to you and explain. And on the right-hand side are the points that are really important to come out in this letter. So now I used to be very strict about saying you must use these words. This is the best way. I'm a little bit not so thinking about that now because I know that people have made changes and felt more comfortable writing the letter slightly differently. Uh, and that's fine because they've still had success. But it is important that they get these people are sent a letter. It must be personalised and it must come through the mail. No emails, please. People don't read emails, especially if they don't know what it's all about. They'll go, oh, not interested. But let send them a letter in the mail. Everybody, I don't think there's anyone that wouldn't receive a handwritten envelope in the mail today and wouldn't open it because you just don't see them. So that's really important. All right, so the letter would start off with dear, and as I say, it must be personalised. So if you do run these off on a computer, that's okay, but leave the space for the name out and handwrite that, and you sign it. The person, the president, it's the president that signs the letter. He or she must sign it by hand as well. Okay, so dear Fred, a respected member of our Rotary Club has put forward your name as a leader in business with a professional attitude and someone involved in our community. I would therefore like to extend an invitation to you to come to a relaxed evening with like-minded people to hear about the activities of Rotary International and your local Rotary Club. Okay, so you've told them what it's about. No hidden surprises, not trying to get them under any other idea. They're being, coming to hear about Rotary. And so if they really don't want to know about Rotary, they won't come, obviously. Okay, the next paragraph is to tell you what Rotary, why Rotary is an important thing to come and hear about. It has been said that Rotary has a destiny to become the most important non-government, non-religious, non-profit, non-political organisation in the world's history. So you've covered the lot there. We believe this is true and would like you to hear about what we are doing in the whatever community you're in and the world. Now you're telling them what's going to happen. The evening has been arranged by the Rotary Club of mm -hmm, and will be held on Tuesday, 10th of June, 2023, at the RSL Club at 6.30pm. So telling them where and when. Wine and finger food has been organised. So you're telling them that it's going to be a stand-up finger, finger, finger food party rather than a sit-down meal. Please don't have a sit-down meal. It is the worst thing you can do because you can have the people They'll come in, they'll sit in the chair. They might mingle a little bit at the beginning, but, you know, they sit in the chair and whoever they're sitting with, they're stuck with. So it might be really good. They might love being who they're next to, but they could also be sitting next to, you know, old Bill who's 99 and can't hear properly and, you know, that would be a disaster. So don't have a sit-down meal. Have a, have a nice um, casual cocktail party, if you like, whatever. Then you say, please confirm your attendance. So you're asking them to let you know if you can come or, or can email me. Um, and your partner is also welcome to attend. 
And I can tell you now that there have been times when you've invited the butcher, he's brought his wife along and they've both joined. So it's important to, to try and bring partners in. These days, you know, it's quite normal to have married couples or couples in a club together. If you would like to attend but for some reason unable, please let me know so that another opportunity can be arranged for you. Don't let them get away. Tell them that you, you're happy to organise something else. And finally, we hope you will be our guest on this evening and I look forward to getting to know you better. In other words, we don't ask, we're not asking you to pay anything. You're our guest. And that's important too. So you'll need to put aside some budget for to run this. And then sincerely, and whoever the president is. So looking at that list on the right-hand side, just a reminder, it needs to be personalised. It needs to make the person feel special. That's the very first one, you know. Um, tell them why they are being invited, what they will hear about, what will happen on the night. Mention nibbles and drinks. No charge. Bring a friend. And, and you can even say that. Bring you know, bring um, your partner or, or a friend is also welcome fed. You could even put that in. Uh, other opportunities to come if you missed this one, hand sign it, send by post, not email, and hand address the envelope. And if you do that, then I can assure you that you'll get a good response of people opening and, and reading and considering it. Okay. So on along comes the night. You hold the event. Lots of people turn up, hopefully 20 if you've invited 20, but probably not. But, you know, you, you might be lucky. So they come along and you hold the event. And the running sheet would be something like this. Okay, you welcome everyone in. Maybe the president makes a little tiny, tiny, weeny speech to welcome people in. You give them all drinks, you mix and chat, just, you know, keep it all nice and friendly, a bit of, um, you know, what it, um, chatter. Bring out the food. We don't want them standing around hungry. Let them eat and drink and feel good. And then we go into story time, and I'll come to that in a minute. After story time, more mixing and chatting, and this is when they start to ask the more interesting questions like, how much is it going to cost me? What, you know, do I have to come every week? Are women allowed? You know, all those questions that a lot of people think Rotary is still is because they don't know it's made, changed. So that's where you, you'll need to answer those questions and make sure that they're answered fully. And it's very important that people really do know there is a cost to being involved in Rotary. Unfortunately, for some people, it's quite a lot, but it is there and, and they must know that because you don't want them to turn up, come along three weeks and then say, oh, sorry, I can't afford it. Um, then someone thanks the people for coming and tells them we will be in touch. And then you must give them something to take home. And I'll tell you about that in a minute too. Okay, so story time. What's your story? Well, you need to find three to five people in your club to tell their Rotary story. Now, their Rotary story could be a personal story about, um, you know, why they joined Rotary, what they're getting out of Rotary, that sort of thing. Or it could be some, or they could then just describe some of the many opportunities Rotary offers. And you try and pick First of all, you pick Rotarians that don't ramble on and that are good at stopping when they should because only speak for three minutes. Don't go on any longer than that. So they need to be able to speak with us, you know, succinctly and, and tell, their, tell whatever they're going to talk about. Try and pitch your, um, your stories to the people that are coming. So if you're in an area where you've got a lot of 40, 45, 50-year-olds, those people are going to quite likely have children in their late teens, early 20s. So talk to them about youth exchange, talk to them about RILA, talk to them about uh, Rotaract as well. Tell them that these are other opportunities because their children might like to get involved as well. Or you might have um, some elderly people and uh, so you can talk to them about travel because Rotary offers a lot of opportunities for travel, fellowships, that sort of thing. So have a good think about who's coming and what are the and then of course what the best things are about your club, what your cause is and what you do so that they can get excited and know that as soon as they become a member, they're going to get involved in those things. Some of the things you might like to talk about, you might talk about meetings, just how a meeting works if you have meetings. Um, hopefully they're not boring meetings. Uh, shelter box, you know, there's there's a lots of things that are connected to Rotary that we do all over the world that are just amazing. 
and that can be something that really appeals to people. You, as I said, talk about the Youth Exchange Program and all the other youth programs we have. And then another thing, and we're very lucky if you do this right now, because next year we've got our big, big convention in Melbourne, and this is a great opportunity to, to really have a, an amazing time. I've been to two conventions, and they were just amazing. And it was very and very similar to, I, I think, that when the Olympics, I don't know if, if, if you had anything to do with the Olympics when they came to Sydney, the whole city just becomes a different place. And it's the same with these conventions. You have people coming from all over the world. You know, the, the, the African people wear their costumes and they just look amazing and, and it really is a wonderful time. So use the convention as a selling point for sure. And then, as I said before, don't let them leave empty-handed. And the reason we do that is that the next morning when they wake up, they'll see the brochure that you've given them or the business card you've left, left them with on the table and they'll, it'll remind them of what has actually happened and get them thinking about the night before. So always give them something to take away. And you can either make a brochure of your own, and if you go onto the RI website into the, um, um, the uh, can't think of it, the design area, they even help you make these brochures. So go ahead and do that. Okay, so now we come to the most important part of the whole night. And if you don't do this, I can promise you it won't work. But if you do do it, I promise you, you will get at least one, if not many more, new members. And that is follow up. You must have someone or a number of you ring every single person that came the night before, ring them up the next day and talk to them. Now, you don't ring them up and say, oh, hi, Fred. Glad to see you last night. Do you want to join Rotary? That's not what you're going to do. You're going to ring up and say, hi, Fred, how did you find last night? Start with an open-ended question that will get them talking about the evening and then you can go from there. And then ideally, if they say, yeah, it sounds all right, not a bad idea, well, come along next Wednesday or whenever your meeting is and um, get to meet us all again and, and we can tell you a bit more about what we do. And, you know, next Saturday we're doing a Bunnings barbecue. Would you like to come along and help? You know, that sort of thing. Get them involved as soon as you can. And if you're doing better, more exciting things than Bunnings barbecues, fantastic. Now, a word of warning. I've heard people say, yeah, we tried your idea and, yeah, we've got lots of people and we've got a few new members, but they left. Now, that's got nothing to do with what I've just told you to get people in. That's nothing to do with the method of, of bringing in members. It's up to the club then to look after those new members. And unfortunately, so often new members start and it's almost like, yeah, we've got them. That's it. But you've got to, you've got to encourage them. You've got to watch make sure that they're enjoying themselves, find out right at the start what was it that really brought you into Rotary, what was it that appeals to you. So make sure that they're getting what they came in for. So if, they're, if they've come because they perhaps live on their own and a little bit lonely and was hoping for fellowship, make sure everyone's very friendly to them and make talk to them and look after them and, you know, find out what it is they're after and then that way you can you will keep your, you will keep your members because, of course, as we've said, um, or you've heard, I'm sure, in the past, that although we're getting still members into Rotary, we're losing a lot as well. And those people we lose are not because they're dying, they're lo we're losing them because they've lost interest in what they're doing and they're not happy with their club. So I do suggest very strongly that you uh, really look after your members. And that's about it. So I'm ready now for questions and um, I thank you very much for listening to me. Fantastic. Thanks, Judy. Judy, a question. Diversity, equity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Critical to the future of Rotary if we're going to be, to be to become a, a more representative organisation of, of our communities and, and get everyone genuinely involved. How do you see the process being able to, your process, being able to help clubs improve their qualities in terms of diversity, equity and inclusion? Well, um, if I look at my area where I'm, I'm, so I'm a member of Gungarland, which is, for those who don't know, Canberra, it's north of Canberra. Uh, I actually don't live in Canberra. I live in Murrum Bateman, but that's another story and another state. But anyway, um, but Gungarland is in a fairly multicultural area, but there's a quite a, a large number of um, Indian, people from India living in the area. So 
this is where you've got to start looking and seeing if there are other um, nationalities, other other cultures around, and try and get them involved too, because that's that's what we're about. We're not about. We don't want to be all just full of white Australians, and and uh, you know, it's amazing what you learn from from having people from other countries. We've got a lovely lady from Croatia, and uh, you know, and then another one that's come from uh, one of the um, eastern countries, and then and we've got a lovely lady from Iran. So. You know, that's a real mixture of different cultures and they talk about it. And we we always, this is something I always suggest too, is that when you get a new member, once they've settled, get them to use an evening or a meeting to talk about, uh, you know, where they where they come from, what their background is, what brought them to Australia and all that sort of thing. It's amazing what you learn about people and otherwise you just, you know, you don't know much about them at all. So so I think looking at the people that you're inviting to these meetings is, is really important and try and get a cross-section, not just all the same sort of person. Fantastic. Now, one of the issues, of course, for us as a movement is that um, we, we do have a number of clubs that do have a lot of very experienced or older members. Mm -hmm. Glenn Mitchell's got a question here about that issue. So over to you, please, Glenn, to put your question to, to Judy. Good evening. How are you going? Um, we've, we've, in our club, we've got uh, currently a club of some 10 members. Um, mm -hmm. One of our members just, just celebrated 50 years in Rotary mm -hmm. as a Rotarian. He, um, amongst others, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult because the club is, is an older club and it's been around for some time and there's a, a wealth of experience within the club. You know, we, we'd we come up with the ideas that we'd like to do this or we'd like to have this type of evening or do this. Oh, we've done that. We've done this. We've done So it, you keep hitting a stumbling block from time to time. Um, and we, we have tried well, uh, We have tried to to invite. Uh, I, I noticed I've got a message from um, Warren Norton um, getting a group of young people to come along in, in, a, in a, a one night. Well, that's something we're, I'm looking at doing, but I'm also looking at having... I've got a through my business. I've got to contacts with a lot of um, some Indian people, so I'm going to sort of basically have an Indian night, so to speak, and and see. If, and we're using some of the steps that that I've got from Judy tonight to bring them along as well. So, just want to try and keep it going. You know what I mean? Is yeah. there something else that we're doing that we can't that we should could do? Is that where, are you in a are you in a city or a town? Where, what where's your? Uh, we're te Teacher Gully, just out on the northeast suburbs of Adelaide. Okay, so so it's suburban type yes. of area, is it? Suburban yeah. type. Yeah. Well, I guess um, you know, the the thing is if you've got if your majority of your members are quite elderly, then you don't want to start looking for 20 year olds really because they're not going and you know, they won't enjoy it and, and it's not their thing. But you can certainly start looking at um, you know, people that are in their forties, late forties, fifties, sixties sort of thing, that you know, people that are on the verge of retiring. And actually, I, I have no problem with people uh, that are retirees coming into Rotary because often that's when they are looking for more friendship and and unless they're, you know, bedridden or whatever, they can contribute so much as well. So, you know, we, we need to be careful that we don't discount older people and think that it's all got to be the young ones because, you know, older people can also bring their children who can be part of the... And I'm talking from experience here because my daughter's in our club as well. So... You know, you you don't be too hung up that you can't have old people as well and as new members. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Judy. I might just mention another of our membership voice library items, one that uh, we got from Ballina on Richmond uh, a couple of months ago, and that's a satellite club that they started in a lifestyle village. In other words, a you know, group of retirees, and they they now have a satellite with 28 members. And, and the sig yep, significance of that is that that's an area that's been devastated by these floods, and those those folk have delivered some, have provided something like oh, I think it's thirty thousand meals to people who've been working on flood recovery work, victims mm -hmm. of the floods and and the like. So there's and they're kind of a ready made fit because they just like yeah. to come along and do a bit of volunteering and enjoy. You know, perhaps have one meeting a month and socialise a bit, and it's a pretty good fit. But I was going to ask a sort of a supplementary question to, to, to Glenn's thing here about this, this concept of a club within a club. 
where you go out and aim to recruit a group of people uh, who may have similar interests with the with the idea of perhaps starting a satellite, as yep. per our story from Lindisfarne in Tasmania. Yeah. Um, would well, you say, uh, how, how would you see that going, Judy? I mean, obviously, there's a challenge. Um, yeah, there are. I've been through a satellite club, and and there were challenges. And uh, I think if you're going to start a satellite club, you must make sure that whoever's going to sponsor that satellite club, the the club, is really behind the idea, and uh, and gives every bit of um, uh, help and support. And I think it's important, if possible, that the satellite club should um, operate like its own club with a president and the secretary and all that sort of thing but obviously they're still all their finances will be involved um, with the other club eventually I I really like that idea of your your retiree thing your, your um home I think that's fantastic and and of course the other thing about what you just said there I was going to say is they've got a real cause and doesn't that make a difference they've got something that they can hang all of their stuff on. I mean, they can do other things on the side, but they've got a really important function and, and that's fantastic. And I think if you're going to start up a satellite club, that's something they need to look at. And in fact, where um, my husband and I, my husband's a past district governor and we're looking at uh, starting up a satellite club in Murray Bateman, where I live. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the things we're starting to look at. What are we going to have as the thing that's going to say to people, hey, come and join Rotary because you can help us do whatever. That's an, that's an important thing to start with. You can't just bring in people and then say, now what are we going to do? Yeah, it's that that reason for being is is absolutely critical. And mm. Eleanor on Richmond is a is a classic case of a club that's got that one right because they, they went for domestic violence big time. Roseanne Carver has a question about a multi-club event which is, I think it's fascinating, say particularly where there might be a group of smaller clubs involved. But over to you, please, Roseanne, to ask your question. I live in a small town of about 10,000 people. We have two Rotary clubs and there's another one in a, in a town nearby about half an hour away. Uh, we actually work cooperatively on a number of things, including a major domestic violence um, project. Funny that you should just mention that. Um, but I was wondering whether there... Um, whether it would work if we tried to do um, a joint information night for at least the two Swan Hill clubs, potentially the the other club as well, um, as a way of, I, I suppose, the, thinking about it as a big hour of Rotary, trying to attract people to Rotary and not fussing too much about which club they go to. Have has, have there been any examples of? Well, I, I can't say I know of any, but I think that's a fantastic idea because, you know. So often all clubs become very protective of their future members. And the fact that you work all together and do other projects together, I don't think it matters as long as, you know, you're all, all happy with um, who turns up. But usually the people, when you invite the people, they soon cotton on to who's been the person that suggested them. Uh, so they would probably still go towards that person's club. Uh, I, I think that's a really great idea and, and it's the more more people you can't have come along and you'll get more the bigger your number of people, number of members that are coming up with names, then the more chances you're going to get a good sized number. And and it really is, in some ways, it is a bit of a numbers job. You know, you, if you invite 20 people, I reckon you'd be good at getting five or six members out of that for sure, but maybe more. And uh, certainly I know of one club in our district when I first started talking about this, they did a grand job. They got uh, something like 16 new members out of the night. I must say, though, that they didn't look after those people and a lot of them left soon after. But but still, you know, it does work. Um, but, yeah, I'd do that, definitely. Right. Thanks, Roseanne, and, uh, and thanks, Judy. Uh, at this stage, I want to go over to past Governor Elaine Mead uh, over in New Zealand. Uh, because she's just offered a perspective on, I think, the multi-club thing. But over you, please, Elaine. So, yes, Judy, um, you were asked the question just recently about multi. Um, in fact, just here in New Zealand, we've had Andy Rajapaksi and Barbara Mifsud over for two weeks doing a New Zealand roadshow through all our districts, and they joined us in um, Whangarei. We have an area, so there's a cluster, an area there, area two, and it has four clubs and one uh, more rural, just sort of nearby. And they ran an information event that was done in the afternoon. 
and it was all five clubs did it together. So pretty much running the same system that you've talked about, um, we've used that system by a number of clubs here, and they chose to have displays from each club that were there for the mix and mingle for the clubs to... <clears throat> for people to go and look at but then and the people who spoke again were as per your outline on the topics that were of a particular relevance for them in rotary uh, from across the clubs mm-hmm. and the they all agreed in the lead up to the new organization that they would not that they would talk about rotary generally so whilst their club displays were there if people were going around and talking to them and, and if they were sort of talking about clubs or talked about something that maybe they were more morning person and they were to happen to be talking to someone who was from an evening club, the person would direct them over to someone who was there who was from that morning based club. So they took your took the concept, but we just expanded it out. Mm. Sounds fantastic. And and I hope they come and do the same for all of us over here. But um yeah, look that that's that's the perfect way of doing it. And of course if clubs could put on a bit of a display as well as having talking all the better, you know, if you've got posters and photos and things like that. But most clubs probably aren't able to do that. But uh, the more you can illustrate things and show people just all the opportunities. I I think this is one of the most frustrating things is that it's trying to tell people that Rotary isn't just turning up at a meeting and listening to a guest speaker, that there is so much more and that's what you've got to get across to people. But no, that you're very lucky you've had them there. Two great people, for sure. They certainly are. Thanks, Elaine, and thanks, Judy. Um, Glenda's made a comment. Glenda Bryson's made a comment here. Glenda, is there a question? Is that is there is there a, is that wrapped around a question, or was that just a comment? No, that was just a comment, Caro, and it's been beautifully um, demonstrated by Elaine just then. Super. Thanks, Glenda. Uh, similarly. Um, Nancy, is that a comment or is there a, is there a question there? It's basically a comment. Um, but, yeah, it's something that, that people need to be aware of that sometimes in the uh, wider community there's a bit of hoo-ha that goes on that makes it a bit mm. tricky. Yeah. Yeah, where, so, where you've got this, this a jealousy relationship or between your clubs, it can make something like this very difficult. But uh, fortunately, there's a lot of situations where that's not the case. In fact, we had a story out of Kingston last in Canada last year where so there were six clubs in, a, in the AG cluster. They put their heads together and formed a combined membership team, and this is with COVID happening and whatever, and, every, and all six clubs, which had been declining, had a turnaround and they all grew. So, you know, collaboration can actually develop new positivity in the in the whole scene too. But I'm going to go over to Tim Blackburn now for his question. Over to you, please, Tim. Thank you, Caro. I'm one of those rare Toastmasters. I've only been a member for three or four years. So and I've been now put in position of president of a Rotary Club. And I guess where when I've one of the first things I did was just review the process that club has gone through in recruiting members. And some of the other observations I've noticed is that I think because the members have been there for so long, there's, there's, there's almost like a friendship club rather than an active recruitment process of bringing new people on board. So I feel that there's a real lack of engagement by the long-term members to engage new members so or to, to find or contact with, and a lot of them are probably retired workers who now sort of put their foot up and relax rather than a lot of them are going to golf clubs they've got other activities outside of their circles that they could really start tapping into and just inviting them to go through so but I, my lead-up question is there seems to be lack of flow through of marketing material to go out to members to say here's an invitation to invite guests to come along to meetings so that's one thing we're looking at incorporating in our club is this is this a trend do you see happening or um is my observations just related to my club um well 
I, th I think the, the people you've described are pretty common in clubs, you know, the going playing golf and all the rest of it. If you haven't done anything like this, then I reckon this is your opportunity uh, to, to try something different. And I think you'd find that if you do it as a, a um, uh, you know, get your, all your members together and have a, a brainstorming about who you can invite to the, the information evening, it'll get them talking because they'll start realising because you may have people that would really like one of their golfing mates to join your club, but they're just not prepared to ask them. But in this situation, they can do it anonymously and and they might feel a bit more, a bit more ready to, to share the great story of Rotary to their friends. So I think this is your great opportunity to do something different and, and put your mark on the club and get some new members in. Just thank you, Tim, and, and thank you, Judy. What, an observation I'd make about this process is, one that I've seen happen a few times is that if you if you work on the showcase, the showcase part of this, like showing off the great things about your club to these new people, it can actually generate some mini ah heart moments mm. for your yeah. existing members. And I've actually seen some quite dramatic yeah. turnarounds there. In fact, I think it was Rotary Adelaide who used this process or used an yeah. enlarged form of this process and who had a dramatic turnaround as a yeah. result. We have a story about, surprise, surprise, we have a story about that too. At this stage, I'm going to invite Mark Huddleston, a club attraction specialist, to make a comment. Over to you, Thanks Pete. very much, Cara. Hello, Judy. How are you going? Hi, Mark. Good to see you. Now, I absolutely adore Judy and I love this plan and uh, I've um, I've recommended so many clubs across my time they try it because I agree if you follow it to the letter, it does, it, it absolutely works. So congratulations, Judy. Um, uh, but And Judy did mention this at, right at the very start of her presentation. I think it's really critical um, that um, you don't enter a recruitment campaign until you absolutely know that the product is right. And I've seen this time and time again where clubs have, like, they're hemorrhaging members. They lose a lot of members in a very quick period of time. And that tells me there's something wrong with the system in the club. And the knee-jerk reaction is, well, let's have a recruitment campaign. And I sort of think that's the worst thing you can do because you can actually be successful and bring people into a failing model. Uh, and then you will never see them. You've got no hope of getting them again. It's so critical to do that introspection Maybe do the club health check. Maybe speak with your some district people, your assistant governor. Get some um, objective assessment of where the club's going, and just because often the internally the members like they sort of can't see the wood, the forest for the trees. They they can't see some of those issues, and they think everything's going fine. So it's just so important to do that work on the club first, and then enter into the recruitment campaign. I guarantee if you if you do it in that order, you'll get much better results. But um, just a huge fan of your work, Judy. So keep up the keep up the good work, and and thanks, Caro, for inviting Judy on tonight. Thanks, Mark. Much appreciated. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Judy. And here's another plug for membership voice. The library is chock a block full of uh, case studies, examples of best practice so, or successful practice clubs, and there's something there for any club that wants to, uh, to have a go. And just to explain something that's not off, not perhaps well understood, our stories uh, our, our stories are typically uh, an hour long. Oh, sorry, the, 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 the whole webinar is an hour long, but the, the presentations are more typically 15 to 20 minutes. So if you start off having a look at that and then you can go on to the questions if you find one that really resonates with you. So anyway, there's, that's the plug over, sort of over, and, over and done with. Question. Judy, what mistakes have you seen people make with, with your process? Okay, well, I go back to the, the old guest speaker. You know, some, some clubs have said, oh, no, you've got to have someone that's going to be a draw card, you know, the, the, that people are going to th say, oh, gee, I'd like to hear that person and they come along. It's no good because it takes all the emphasis off what they're there for and that's to hear about Rotary. And... Uh, and as I said before, the other thing is that um, if you have it as a dinner, then you're going to you're sure to have people. They sit there and they don't mix. They don't talk to the people that they're interested in talking to. They don't often. They don't feel like asking the questions they want to ask because they sort of you know they're a bit stuck in in a dinner situation. Whereas if you've got the the cocktail party type style, people can move around and. And if you've got a few astute members that keep an eye open to see if there's anyone standing alone or 
is looking a bit unhappy or whatever, you go over and help them out and that sort of thing. So um, I think those are the two major things I've heard before. Um, and as I said at the very beginning, make sure you pick a date first because otherwise you'll start doing all this and then it'll never actually happen because you haven't worked out when you're going to do it. But uh, the letter I used to say keep to what I've written, but I don't think that's so important as long as you get the, the letter out there. And, and then, of course, the very end, which I said, if they don't follow up, forget it. Fantastic. Thanks, Judy. And I, it might sound like a similar question, but I'd like as, as a supplementary to that mm -hmm. to go to if you've been running this process uh, and, and consulting regarding this process for a long time now and mm -hmm. done a great job with it. What are some of the things that you've learned along the way about the process? Um, well, I've learned, uh, I, I always, um, I laugh when I, some of the clubs I've been to, you know, I've, I've turned up and told them that I've come to talk about membership and I've looked around and they're, you know, all pretty old and stayed and all the rest of it. And, and I remember one club I went to, actually, Pete came along with me too, which we had a good laugh afterwards. But um, I got up and started speaking and one of the guys, one of the old guys said, oh, I don't know why you're bothering, it won't work. We've tried it, tried it all. And I said, I haven't even told you what I'm doing yet. And, oh, no, I know what you're going to say. No, it doesn't work, we're not going to do it. And I said, well, I'll tell you anyway. So I went ahead and, of course, at the end of the evening, he said, hmm, okay, yeah, that might work. So I think one of the things I've really learned is that people have got to hear it first before they make up their mind. You know, they've, they've got to think about it and look, sure, I'm sure there have been clubs that have tried it and it hasn't worked as well as they would have liked. And there could be reasons where the wrong people were invited or there weren't enough people invited or they picked the wrong people to, to talk. The very first time that we ever did this with the club I used to be with, um, one of our guys got up and started talking about fundraising. And you could see everyone going, oh, what am I coming into? I don't want to do fundraising. I don't want to sell raffle tickets at the outside the post office and this sort of thing. So that can be a real, really bad thing. So, so there are factors that if they don't, if it's not thought out carefully, then then you can have failure. But on the whole, I think most people get the idea and, and do a good job. Mm. Something that Jesse Harmon has been very, very uh, to the point about this year, Judy, and that's about clubs becoming member centric. That we focus, that we actually focus our our activities on meeting members' needs in Rotary. How how important is that in terms of success in, in maintaining recruits? Well, um, I guess it, well, it depends on on how the member centric thing works. Uh, you know, we want to have people to to all be um, interested in what they're doing and to work together. I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure of just exactly what you mean. What you're after? Well, member centricity is about, for example. Finding out what new what new members want oh, out yeah. of Rotary, and sure. not, yes. not that they tend to know when they first join. No, no. And that's, so that's really what I'm on about. Okay, so so some clubs have mentors, you know, they or buddy systems. So when someone new starts a club into a club, they they team up with somebody that sort of keeps an eye on them and helps them out. We do that a little bit with our club members. Depends on the on the new member too. I mean, some people are pretty confident and assured of what they're doing. They they they're happy to just get on with it. But, uh, you know, other times we've had people that will sort of keep in touch and especially if they don't turn up to a meeting, you know, is there a reason why they haven't come and that sort of thing. Uh, I think that's that's really important. And, you know, with retention, you've got to be careful that you don't ask too much of people as well. I, I mean, like Tim Blackburn saying he's been in Rotary four years, I think he said. And now you're president. Well, that's probably okay, but you know that's still quite early, considering that there's probably, you know, most people go a few more years before they become president. Well, mind you, I mean there are people that come in sort of the next year because mm -hmm. no one else wants to do it, and that's that's always sad as well. Uh, so I, I've seen a situation where um, a young lady, she was in a, she must have been in her early thirties, joined the club I was in. And she'd only been in the club about three months and they suddenly made a youth director because she's young, therefore she must be able to 
look after young people. And I, I mean, that was a terrible thing to do. I mean, youth directors are a big job, especially if you've got to go around schools and get to know schools and all that sort of thing. Totally bad. Believe it or not, she left. You know, I'm not surprised either. There were some really bad decisions there. So, uh, yes, I think that you really do have to be careful of how you treat your new members and, and look after them. And, and if you get the feeling that they're not happy, find out why and, and see what you can do about it. Yeah. Don't make assumptions. Ask them. Oh, that's right. Exactly. Now, at this stage, Judy, I did foreshadow one of my favourite questions of uh -oh. my Rotary heroes, Judy Ford. Yes. <laughs> developer of the Ford process, a Ford recruitment process. Why are you in Rotary? Well, look, I joined Rotary originally. I was a teacher many, many years ago. I've been in Rotary since 1994, so it's a fair time. I um, was a teacher back then. My husband was in the army and away a lot. And I found that my life was just school and nothing else. And uh, anyway, he was I was living in Sydney. He was posted to Melbourne, so I was going to be a, alone. I had kids, of course. And I thought I need something more than just school, school, school. So I'd been quite involved through his Rotary membership. And so when he left, they said, oh, you know, this was in the early days when women weren't around. I think there's one other woman in the club. And they asked if I'd like to join. And I did. And, I, and that was a really good... Um, thing for me because I was talking to people that weren't school teachers and from that I've just found that it's it's just such a wonderful uh, organisation I've got so much out of it I mean I would say that 95% of my friends are Rotarians because we've moved around a bit and we've we've made lots of friends and you know I get the fun and the friendship absolutely and the, the service, well, you know, the, I run a market for our club. I'm, I'm the market manager and I do quite a bit of work on that. I get a lot of in, um, satisfaction from that. Uh, we've been involved in overseas things. I was a GSC um, leader once and that was just an amazing experience. So I've really got so much out of Rotary that I could never not be a Rotarian, I don't think. Fantastic. Thanks, Judy. And you've put a you've put a lot back in. Okay, let's give Judy a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Great work there. Great work. Well done. Thanks, Jude. Thank you. Thank you for being with us and good night.